بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى الطاهرين Welcome to our class Islamic Philosophy and Introduction I am your instructor Mr. Shiraz Aga and today this is the second lesson we're going to be talking about the necessity of studying philosophy or why we should study philosophy And as we said in our first lesson, we're going to be looking at this in a historical fashion, but uh, because uh, it is uh, also necessary when studying something historically to look at uh, some of the views which have come about throughout history, uh, we're going to have to briefly take a glance at some of the major views uh, in a historical fashion which have uh, occurred but we won't be getting getting into the details and the objections which have been leveled at each and one of these views we're just going to be simply listing them and briefly explaining them so that you can gain an acquaintance with some of the views and you can be encouraged to follow up on them and take more classes on philosophy and study them in a more profound manner so the question is clear why should we study philosophy we're going to be looking at this in two different fashions. First of all, we're going to be looking at it from a rational point of view. In other words, we're going to see is that what we're going to be looking at is whether or not reason tells us if philosophy is necessary uh, to be studied. Secondly, we're going to be looking at it from a religious point of view. In other words, whether religion opposes the study of philosophy or whether or not it says that philosophy should be studied. This is also something that we're going to be looking at further on in our third class which is regarding the Islamic nature of Islamic philosophy there we're going to be viewing the hadith and the Quran and what they say about uh, rational contemplation So here by as a way of an introduction I have written four major views regarding the necessity of studying philosophy The first view is by Avicenna Avicenna had a interesting look at Islamic philosophy which is tied up with his view regarding the universals. He was of the opinion that the universals are immaterial and that when man acquires them he acquires within his mind a universal being. And he said that universals because they are not limited to a specific time and place and to matter that the acquisition of these universals Uh, allows man to gain true happiness but because man is concerned with the body and is preoccupied with the relegation of the body in this world he is not able to truly uh, enjoy this acquisition of universals which comes about in the form of philosophy however when man dies and he moves into the next world because he is free from the body he truly gains felicity and ha- happiness through the knowledge of these universals this is a brief view of avicenna the next view is the view of mullah sadra who also had a similar uh, idea of why we should study philosophy and however it is a little bit different he said that uh, the knowledge we have of universals when we gain an understanding of what the universals are we come into contact with real immaterial beings Uh, in the uh, form of immaterial intellects which are separate from the physical world however again because we are connected with the body we are not truly able to understand and the felicity that we can acquire through them however when we are when we die and we move into the next world and are discontinued from our physical bodies we truly appreciate this knowledge of the universals and because the immaterial intellects are in the vicinity of god we also gain a presential and immediate and intuitive knowledge of god and this is one of the reasons why mullah sadra said we should study philosophy these were some of the ancient philosophers one was the founder of the peripatetic islamic school of thought and the other was the founder of the transcendent school of thought in the islamic world Now let's move to some of the contemporary scholars and briefly look at some of the reasons why they said philosophy was necessary 
and it is necessary to study philosophy. In the contemporary world, we have two scholars, one of which is the student of the other. Alama Tabatabai was a contemporary philosopher and who is one of the people who revived Islamic philosophy in the Islamic world today. He is of the opinion that we should study philosophy because man naturally wants to gain an awareness of what is real and what is not real, and he is constantly seeking what is real. However, sometimes he makes a mistake regarding what is real and what is not real, and therefore there should be one science which is founded, which explains to us the general properties of existence, Therefore, and when we come into contact with something which we are not sure whether it is real or not, we can weigh its reality and its objectivity with the laws which has been uh, put forward in this science, which comes in the form of philosophy. The second view is the view of his student and his pupil, Ustad Mispa Yazdi. In his book, Philosophical Instructions, which has been translated into English and which you will learn in your further courses of philosophy, he states some of the reasons why philosophy is necessary and nece it is necessary to study philosophy. There, Mr. Mispa Yazdi says that some of the sciences, or we should say most of the sciences, are founded on a set of axioms. And these axioms cannot be proven within those sciences themselves because those sciences lack the methodology and the tools in order to solve those problems. For example, the idea that every effect needs a cause, which is one of the foundations and the pillars of science, cannot be proven in science itself, and rather it is something which must be discussed in philosophy. Or, for example, the existence of the subject matter of every science is something which cannot be proven in that science itself. It must be discussed in a science separate from them which is philosophy. Or, for example, the epistemological value of the uh, knowledge that we have. What is the epistemological value of the knowledge we have? For example, the senses. How much do they tell us of reality? Or the power of reason. How much does it have the ability to tell us what reality is? These are problems which cannot be discussed in science or in any of the sciences per se. Rather, it must be discussed in a separate science, which is, in his opinion, the science of philosophy. You will learn more about these views in detail and also the objections, some of the objections which have been raised against them in the higher classes of your course. Now that we have gained a brief understanding about the necessity of studying philosophy from a rational point of view, let us look at the necessity of studying philosophy from a religious point of view. As I mentioned in our previous class, we are using as our source of reference two books, The History of Islamic Philosophy by Sayyid Hussein Nasser and Mr. Oliver Lehman, and also The History of Islamic Philosophy by M.M. Sharif. You can download these books or obtain them from your local bookstore, and you can refer to them in order to gain a better understanding about these discussions we have talked about. I'm just presenting you a very in a summarized fashion what they have mentioned in their books. Historically, we see that philosophy was religiously met up with many opponents. From the commencement and from the time it was translated from its Greek sources into Arabic and Persian. Very similarly, in a summarized fashion, I have listed here some of the opponents of Islamic philosophy who said that religiously, not rationally, but religiously, philosophy was not only something that should not be studied, but rather, what is more, it was religiously Im impermissible to be studied. Some of these were the mystics, or the urafa. Secondly, were the jurisprudence, or the fuqaha. Third, were the mutakallameen, which come in the form of the Sunni mutakallameen, the ash'aris. Uh, in, within the Shiite tradition, there was a group of people called the Tafkikis who also believed in the impermissibility of studying philosophy in a specific manner, uh, which will, I will get to very briefly shortly. Also, there was a group of people called the Ahlul Hadith, uh, which, who were opposed to philosophy. 
Many of them share certain traits in common, which you can read about within the references which I have given you. The mystics were opposed to philosophy because they were of the opinion that uh, reality is not something which can be understood through the power of reason which philosophy relies upon. Rather, it should be learned about through the purification of the human soul. The jurisprudence relied heavily on certain hadith and certain verses of the Holy Quran to substantiate the idea that philosophy was impermissible religiously and was something which should be shunned. The theologians who were the which come in the form of the Ash'aris and who are very closely related to the Ahlul Hadith were also of the opinion that philosophy was something impermissible and it was necessary to religiously shun philosophy. They relied heavily on the Hadith and the prophetic traditions in order to substantiate and to corroborate their ideological beliefs. To such an extent that historically it has been related from one of them that uh, regarding the idea of the Arsh which is mentioned in the Holy Quran or the throne of God, somebody asked one of them, what is the meaning of this? He said that uh, its existence is for sure, its meaning is not clear and asking about it is religiously impermissible or a bid'at. Another group uh, which we find within the Shiite tradition is a group of people called, which is called in Persian and Arabic, the school of Tafkir. This group of people were of the opinion that the philosophy and religion should be separate. So they were not diametrically opposed to philosophy per se. In other words, they did not say that studying philosophy was impermissible. However, very specifically, they were of the opinion that philosophy and the pr problems of philosophy, the conclusions of philosophy, and the results which philosophy arrives at are not things which should be imposed upon uh, religious texts. In other words, we should not try to interpret the verses of the Holy Quran, the prophetic traditions, or the traditions of our Imams, alayhim as -salam, uh, using philosophy or any of the other sciences which relied on the power of reason. Uh, you can learn more about these groups within the references I have spoken about and uh, in order to further reference them you can uh, look at other works as well. There are also a group of people called the Ahlul Hadith which are also who were also opposed to and are still opposed to uh, the science of philosophy and in general not specifically philosophy as a discipline but what is more uh, the uh, philosophy in the sense of looking rationally at the world and using the power of reason to understand uh, what the world is and the beings of this universe. Uh, having gained we will uh, also look at more in detail the answers or the opposing view of these people, in other words, those people who believe that philosophy, it is necessary to study philosophy in a, from a religious point of view, we will look at them, uh, look at the views of these people briefly in our third class, which is regards the nature, Islamic nature of Islamic philosophy. In that class, by way of introduction, we're going to be talking about how Islamic is Islamic philosophy. In other words, is Islamic philosophy uh, actually, does it actually have the color and the uh, texture of Islam within it or is it, is, it a foreign, or is it a foreign import which has been imported from Greece and has nothing to do with Islam and it is something which has come into the Islam in, in the form of a foreign element which should be shunned. There we will examine some of the verses of the Holy Quran and some of the prophetic traditions and the, pro and the traditions of our Aima and we will see whether or not uh, philosophy in the form of rational discourse is something which has been uh, uh, substantiated by the religion of Islam or not. This is some of the basic views regarding the necessity of study philosophy. And uh, we can briefly answer the views of these people by saying that there are some tenets of Islam which are impossible to be arrived at without using the, the 
power of reason as a foundation. For example, the existence of God. We cannot take recourse to the Quran and the Hadith without first substantiating the fact that God exists and substantiating some of his attributes, such as the idea that he is a wise being and he is a being which doesn't lie. And also substantiating the idea that the Quran has not been altered. So before we rationally go through these steps, in other words, the idea that God first exists, then the idea that he is a being who is perfect, he's a being who is wise and who does not lie, and also the idea that the Quran historically has not been altered, once we have substantiated these axioms, then we can use the Quran and also the Hadith to corroborate and to prove our religious claims. But before we do, it is impossible to do so. And the only way we can prove these tenets is either through mystic intuition, as the mystics said, or through reason. However, mystic intuition is something which cannot be, which cannot occur and which cannot happen for a being or a person without his traversing certain stages, as the mystics they themselves say. In other words, without adhering to the power, to the tenets of religion, following religion in a very strict manner, after following these stages, we can acquire mystic intuition about the world around us. But that first requires us to substantiate and to prove the truthfulness of a specific religion and then to follow its claims. So therefore we see that it is impossible for us to arrive at mystic intuition without first proving certain tenets rationally. So uh, the claim of the mystics here we see it is uh, erroneous in the sense that they shun rational, rationality and philosophy uh, in a complete manner and we see the necessity of studying philosophy both uh, from a mystical point of view and also from a religious point of view uh, in the form of the Hadith and the Quran. In our next session, we'll also examine some of the Hadith which have been mentioned uh, regarding the impermissibility of studying philosophy. We have certain Hadith which have been related from our Imams in which they have shunned philosophy and have mentioned philosophy as something which should not be used. We will look and examine some of these traditions briefly in our next session uh, regarding the uh, Islamic nature of uh, philosophy. Uh, thank you for joining us in this class and uh, until our next class I bid you farewell. I'm your teacher Mr. Shiraz Aga. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.